Yes, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Melina Labukan Massimo. Melina is a Lubicon Cree from Northern Alberta. She is the founder of Sacred Earth Solar, co-founder and just transition director at Indigenous Climate Action and a fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation. She is the host of a new TV series called Power to the People, which profiles renewable energy in indigenous communities across the country. Melina holds a master's degree in indigenous governance at the University of Victoria with a focus on renewable energy. As part of her master's thesis, she completed a 20.8 kilowatt solar project in her home community of Little Buffalo, which powers the health center at the heart of the Tar Sands. Welcome, Melina. I'm just waiting. Uh, uh, Melina, her uh, web uh, just crashed. She's going to be right back with us in just a wow. moment. Fine. Right. Okay. That's where we had her. She'll be. Well, I hope everyone enjoy. Oh, here she comes. Here she comes. Melina, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Um, I'm honored to pass over to you and I will just remind our audience that if they want to pose questions, please do so in the chat. And if we have a few moments, I'll, I'll pose one or two to you at the end of your remarks. So with that, Melina, the floor is yours. Okay. Hi, hi. <clears throat> hi, Emma. Tansegwakia, Nia Melina Miawapin, Labakan Masimo, Nia Nihiao, Kina Skuntanawao. Sorry for the translation that, that would be hard to translate. That is my language. It's Cree. I just introduce myself in my language. Um, thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> it's nice to be here and join this new platform. So um, please be kind with me. I'm just going to actually pull up a PowerPoint and hope that it works. Um, Brad and I were working on it this morning. So bear with me here. Um, I always love showing photos um, when possible, because I feel like it really helps to um, bring the stories a bit more to life. And um, that's my hope for today, to bring the stories to life. Um, it's just such an honor to be here. Um, for me, artists um, are who bring um, messages to other places in the world. You know, I'm a climate campaigner. I did, I was um, raised as somewhat of an artist, more of a dancer. I used to do dance pieces around colonization um, before I had a back injury. And so that when I received this invitation to speak, I was like, yes, we need more messengers out there. We need more um, people reaching different communities and in, in getting out of the silos that we're in. So this is my offering to just really um, give folks the ability and the stories from, from the ground. And so I'm going to be sharing a little bit of where I'm from and, and the reason why I do this work um, to protect Mother Earth and to abate climate change. And so I'm just going to allow this PowerPoint in hopes that it does show. Um, we were having issues showing the full screen, but the question that I am going to start with today is how do we decolonize? Okay, thank you. It looks good. How do we decolonize? And so that's just a question that I'm going to let everyone sit with for a second. Um, what does decolonization mean to you? Um, have you engaged with it much? Have you not engaged with it much? Do you know what it means? Um, do you not know what it means? I'll, I'll tell a story a little bit about what it means to me, um, but I'm never going to fully answer it for you because I think it's all a personal journey and it's all a lifelong journey. You know, many of us are in the initial stages, if not middle stages, but it's, it's hard to do hundreds of years of colonization. So we are all in this together so to speak, but I'm going to go to the next slide. So this is an interesting platform. Um, so I'm going to go like this. And just to give a bit of introduction to myself, I am Melina Miawapin Lobokan Massimo. Um, I am Lubokan Cree from Northern Alberta. I was born into my community, which is called uh, Little Buffalo. It is uh, Nihiao in our language, uh, Cree territory. And I'll tell a little bit of story of that through photos um, here, but I am uh, the founder of Sacred Earth Solar and also the co-founder of Indigenous Climate Action. You can find us on these websites. Um, we have amazing staff there that are doing amazing work. But to ground myself in where um, I'm from, just to give you some ideas of 
the community that I come from. I was born in the heart of the Alberta tar sands, which some folks might know what that is by at this point. Um, I was born in the Boreal Forest. Um, this is my cookum, my grandmother, um, before she passed away. And that it was actually, this is in the top left is um, my dad. And my dad was hidden from residential school um, until by my cookum and most of my grandparents um, until the age of nine. And because my he was the youngest out of six children and he, he my grandparents realized how brutal the residential schools were. There was residential schools where kids went away from age five to 18 and they did not come back. And then there were some schools where they went away for 10 months out of the years and they came back for two, two months in the summer. And when my grandparents were receiving, um, having their kids come back in the summer, they were noticing how traumatized they were. And so they actually hid my dad, um, hid my dad from residential schools and the Indian agents, which was actually illegal at the time. Um, and you, you could go to jail if you didn't release your children to go to these government um, concentration camps, um, so to speak. And so he was hidden until the age of nine. And um, so I just want to zoom in a little bit more. So this was him. Um, we did not actually sign treaty. We, we were people that did not sign um, treaty to... 88 um, were like an amendment, um, Treaty 88, tre Treaty 8. Um, so yeah, he he was hidden and it was, it was a time where he was raised without any siblings, without any cousins, without any children. He was the only child in hidden um, by himself. So as you can imagine, as a young person, that's pretty traumatizing too. But then when he went to the schools, it, it was even more traumatizing. Um, he was, I'm not going to go into it because it's really upsetting and I will just get upset. It's really hard for most Indigenous peoples to talk about this. Um, but I wanted to bring it up today because I think it's important for people as they are reading in the news um, about the 215 children that were found in the mass grave that this is um, not just an isolated incident. This was a thing that was commonplace in our communities across the country. <laughs> And it happened and there was impact to every single family member, every single person that was born an Indigenous person in this country. Um, was, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting an Adobe flash trying to, um, was impacted. And so I think that's the thing that's really hard when you see news stories um, about um, mass graves that you know that. You, I grew up hearing about um, murdered children or missing children that never returned home from residential schools. So it's, it's a very common knowledge for our communities. And um, yeah, and it's common about the abuse and the rape and the beatings, um, which happened to all of our family members um, going to these schools. It was a pretty horrific place to be as a child. So that was some of the um, history I learned as a young person. And it was really hard to be raised in this country where you knew all of this history, but nobody else knew it alongside with you if they were non-Indigenous, um, if they didn't come from a community where their family would even tell you about it. Some pe some families didn't even talk about it because it was so traumatic. Um, my family still slowly tells me stories um, throughout the throughout the um, the years. Um, so I just wanted to bring that picture up because I think it's important for folks to know that aren't Indigenous, that these are every single family has a story. Every single family has that trauma because, you know, I am the first generation that did not go on my paternal side to residential school. So that's the community I was born into. And that's, <clears throat> that is, that's why we call it intergenerational trauma because there was a lot of trauma that was passed down from children that were completely traumatized, traumatized for the first, you know, close to 20 years of their lives, um, bringing that back into our own communities, tearing apart the very social fabric of our communities and, and where we come from. And because our communities were so intact, um, you know, I'm going to show this photo. I usually talk about the Boreal and that's the top right photo. Um, the Boreal Forest is such a pristine, beautiful place um, that is being just like I'm in Currently, I am in the Kwangan territory on Vancouver Island, where there's immense deforestation, 
We have also experienced back home in our homeland, the tar sands, immense deforestation as well. Um, when I first started campaigning on tar sands issues in 2007, people didn't even call it the tar sands, really. They just, they when I'd say, what do you work on? I'd say, um, oh, tar sands issues. And they'd say, oh, like Tarzan and Jane, like that movie, Tarzan. And that was kind of the extent of people's knowledge of what the tar sands was. Um, they were just calling it the rigs in the 90s. Um, no one, there was no national dialogue of going from conventional oil and gas, which is still detriment, detrimental and has such an impact, environmental impact to um, unconventional, extreme, hard to reach, um, carbon intensive, um, water um, intensive oil or tar sands. And so it's it's called bitumen technically, and it's a very hard to reach um, area from our homelands, but it actually spans a hundred um, and 80 square kilometer. I think, it, no, now I'm blanking right now because um, it spans um, as big as big as the, the size of England and Wales together. So you can either see England and Wales and you put it inside of Alberta, it's 23% of the project, um, province. So it expands a lot. So there's a mass amount of impact here. I'll show another slide that will be helpful. I have to switch back and forth between these platforms. Um, so if you see here in Alberta, it's 23% of the province. Um, it's a huge amount um, of impact. And so here we are. I was born in the left blotch, which is called Peace River. Um, my community is about an hour away from there. And then you see a whole other mining area um, in SAGD underground mining. And so it's a huge amount of impact to almost a quarter of the province. Um, if you can put, you can put the size of the state of Florida into that impact zone. And that's how big it is just to give everyone an, an idea. If you haven't been to Northern Alberta um, about the impact zone that we're talking about and why it is one of the largest industrial um, sites in the world and why it needs to be talked about more, why it needs to be um, stopped in Canada for us to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. It's the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in the country. Um, but politicians don't like to talk about that. Um, and the impact is, is you know, um, creating catastrophic climate change, but it's also creating um, just environmental degradation and impact. Um, you can see here the Mackenzie River Basin. So the slide on the top left is one of the largest um, intact water systems in the world. Um, it's an inland delta. Um, it's the Peace Athabasca Delta, so it's Peace River where the Athabasca goes into the Arctic, and so it's this fresh, pristine water that flows from, you can see on the right here, which, which are depleting significantly glaciers, glacier-fed water systems that they're extracting to make um, oil and then toxifying the water and putting back into the watersheds, which is why communities are getting cancer. And also you can see here on the left bottom, um, local caribou or um, will become locally extinct extinct by 2040 is what the reports and research has shown that animals are literally becoming extinct um, within our territories because of um, deforestation fragmentation of the pristine boreal the northern lungs of mother earth that hold in the carbon and we are by in 2014 we were number one in deforestation in the world to um, because of the tar sands and because of um, the forestry industry that is just kind of taking down these ancient old growths, which is happening in our territory as well. Um, different types of trees in the rainforest, but it is the boreal and it is the northern lungs of Mother Earth that go all across Europe. And as we know, most of Europe has been deforested. So this one little bit in Canada is what is left in a lot of parts of the world in the north of an intact forest, which is um, significantly not becoming the case uh you can i won't talk too much about this but this oil you can read more or uh, not read more but listen to oil on lubicon land it's a photo essay where i talk about this massive oil spill that happened next to my community and my family's homes where it was 4.5 million liters that leaked out of a pipeline and just broke and went into our traditional territory my family couldn't breathe, their eyes were burning, their stomachs were turning. They had to actually shut down the, the community school for two weeks because it was just wafting into the community, all these toxic fumes. Um, 
A lot of the community members you can see here had to clean up as the jobs of this oil, massive oil spill, one of the biggest in Canada and Alberta's history. And then after the company said that they had cleaned it up, you can see here in the bottom part, um, we went back, uh, this is 15 months later, and I was still pulling out toxic sludge. And so that apparently is good enough and gets the stamp from the Alberta government. And that is what is now still in our territory, just toxic um, toxicity left into um, our homelands and into the waterways and into the land and into where animals um, are in and around that area. We found actually um, there was bears in around that area and also wolf prints. Um, so that means that they're also getting into this toxicity as well. Um, as you can imagine, it was really upsetting because, um, you know, this is when your family's being poisoned by an oil spill, it's a hard thing to stomach. Um, so I think it's just really important to vote to um, to understand when we're talking about environmental racism, there's a difference um, between impact of the ways in which communities of color, black, brown and indigenous bodies are being impacted significantly higher because they're put around refinery communities, they're put beside toxic sites. And so that's why our communities bear the toxic burden for the rest of Canada and the rest of North America for our global addiction to oil. Um, as you can see here, um, this map gives you an understanding a little bit more of that, of the refinery communities, the toxic sites, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in Houston, say, for example, that are communities of color um, that are also receiving the end product um, where tar sands is refined in one of the many communities, Chevron out west. So the, this is little tentacles that spread out from the tar sands pipelines natural gas pipelines, we have fracking, we have oil and gas, we have logging, and we have tar sands in the community that I'm from. So there's a massive impact zone. So as you can imagine, when you're completely surrounded by it, um, it does feel all encompassing. So the truth today too is what I wanted to say is colonization has not ended. Um, I think it's very apparent that we live in a world that is out of balance from a destructive, careless economy based on patriarchal colonial values. And we are living in, in an era of neocolonialism, which I would call neocolonialism, um, where you see indigenous communities and communities of color um, being living as economic hostages, where that is the only industry around um, for jobs. And then therefore the industry likes to say, well, the community agreed with it. Um, and so it makes it very challenging to um, break away from this uh, resource extraction for some communities because they're completely surrounded by it. And that's all is available for them to stay in the community, to live at home, to be on our territory, um, to work with the industry that's literally destroying our homelands. I chose not to do that. And I became a climate campaigner, an environmental campaigner, but that's not always the path of everyone else. Um, and, you know, what I really wanted to say as well is that this is why we call it cultural and environmental genocide, why we talk about further encroachment, contamination, destruction of our territories, re resulting in a loss of culture, traditions, customs, languages, is, is just that. It is um, when you are surrounded by such beauty, when you, I grew up in the 80s um, where the land was at the beginning of impact, they built an all-weather road into our nation around 79 before I was born. And by 88, um, there was already blockades in our home, homelands. For folks that are older, younger people don't really remember that history. But whenever I talk to anyone that's my parents' age and they know the nation that I'm from, they're like, oh, I remember that because we actually had boycotts of the Calgary Olympics in 88. Um, and my family, my community, all the people, kids, I was on the blockade in 1988 as a seven-year-old. Um, that's the reality of Indigenous communities. This is, the, this is something that we've inherited because if you see the beauty of, of our territories and then you see this is what it's being replaced by, I think a lot of our young people are being moved to, um, to um, action. And so that's why, you know, what we see is industrialized landscapes, drained and polluted watersheds and contaminated air. This is what we are beginning to breathe in, beginning to drink, having to eat the land from um, because we are 
indigenous peoples, we live off of the land. Um, and now people are scared to pick medicines. Um, there is impact to even my dad found a moose that had um, what looked like cancer, yellow meat. Um, so that means he ate vegetation, the moose ate vegetation that was contaminated from the local industry around. Um, so what does neocolonialism look like? It's an encroachment of Indigenous lands through resource extraction and exploitation. Neocolonialism like involving, involving the use of state-funded governments, businesses, organizations to control Indigenous peoples and communities. The lack of recognition, which we've seen time and time again, of traditional Indigenous leadership and governance. And then the lack of support um, by settler communities when corporations work hand in hand with government. And I think this is why this conversation is so important today, because it's important for folks to know how they can become allies um, in if they are settlers in this homeland or not in our homelands. One other point I wanted to make is the connection between violence against the earth and violence against women. Um, and how colonial values of patriarchy, capitalism, exploit the land and exploit women. Um, this is something that's very close to my heart as well. Um, it's, you know, as, as people now have seen um, more and more um, coverage on missing and murdered Indigenous women um, and unsolved cases of women and girls, um, my sister being one of them, you can see um, Bella Lebocan McLean in the left middle row far left. Um, she was a student who was just graduated from college in Toronto um, at Humber in the fashion arts, also an artist and um, was found dead three months after she graduated. Um, wrong place, wrong time. Um, and there's been no justice for her death. And it's been a really hard, hard um, reality to live with um, working on you know, trying to protect our homelands, but also trying to protect Indigenous women and Indigenous relatives, two-spirited women and men um, that are going missing and murdered across the country. Um, so it is immense. It is, you know, oh, for, for the stats that I've seen, our MMIW is for 4,000 and up to 6,000 in America. Um, you can also watch an interview I did on CNN on United Shades of America to get more information on this. Um, if you go to the Sacred or Solar webpage, you can click on, on that or, or find it on Instagram. I actually just posted it on IGTV um, with Cam Bell. Um, it's, as you can imagine, really hard to talk about these things um, because they are so pers personal. Um, sorry, it's been a really rough week, but... Um, I think the point is, is that it's not a coincidence that our women are dying just like the land is dying. But when we lose our women, we're losing that connection to, the, to our cultures and to Mother Earth because they are the life givers. They are the ones that carry life into this world. And a part of the Indian Act and colonial government policy has been to sterilize our women as well. It's, you know, it's an ugly history and it's a legacy that, you know, our younger generations are inheriting. And I think it's important to not look away and to face this full on, to face this now, because if we don't face it, if our settler allies and settler Canadians don't face the history um, that has been hidden from them, I think it's, we're not going to get to a place where we can, you know, address the 11 years that we have left. We need to work in, in solidarity and in love with one, you know, in, in care and respect and in love with one another. But if we don't have a basis of understanding of, of our collective history, I think that's what keeps us apart. Um, I'll finish a little bit on a, on a higher note, but um, <laughs> what does just transition look like to renewable energy? So when I had a major, we had the major oil spill back home, I thought, what is the yes to a no? What can we implement? How can we um, do? How can we save Mother Earth? Um, it's really hard when you're always just protesting, you know, for for I've been an organizer for 20 years and um, it's hard when you just protest and you don't build the yes. What is building the yes to the no's that we're always having to say? 
Um, one thing I wanted to mention is the United, Na United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. If you don't know about that, please do look it up. It's all over the internet. You can get a nice little package um, of all the different sections. I wanted to draw your attention to Section 32, which you'll hear a lot of Indigenous peoples talk about, free prior and informed consent. Um, this is international law. Canada has signed on to it, but they have not make it, made it legislatable and or accountable in this country. They just say um, have had some nice lip service, but it essentially gives communities the ability to say no to resource extraction. And that's what we have not seen implemented time and time again when communities have said no over the years. Um, with the critical paradigm shift that we need to happen, um, I heard Emma talking a bit about this morning where with an Indigenous worldview, you know, it is about reciprocity. It is about having an intimate relationship with Mother Earth. It is about reconnecting to the land knowing that all life is sacred. And that's why you see so many frontline indigenous activists literally putting their lives on the line because they were raised with this, um, with this cultural um, knowledge. Uh, and so indigenous governance how we have had collective care structure in place pre-contact and now we are building those back and we've always functioned as collectives, not through an individual, individual individualistic um, lens. We've had shared decision-making structures, um, and we've also had systems in place of collective care, healing ceremony, accountability process, and redistribution of wealth. These are all integral and a part of Indigenous communities, and that has been ripped apart from colonial policy, but we are in a process of revitalization, resurgence, and that is why you see so many young Indigenous peoples rising out of um, the colonial mind. So to finish, I'll talk about um, the community-based solar that we've been implementing um, in my community of returning to what you know was called zero waste communities, which our communities always have been. This is um, Lubicon Lake, um, my community in Little Buffalo. This is Carlton, he was 21. It was the first time we ever had solar panels in our community. Um, I started fundraising for this project in 2013, 14. We put it up in 2015. Um, we built a 20.8 kilowatt system. You can see the end product here. It actually powers our health center in the heart of the tar sands and it's right um, in front of the school. So young kids from the age of five to the age of 12 will, you know, for the first time in their lives, they'll see solar um, in our community, which we've never seen. And this was our ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, we had a solar feast. It's called Pitapan, which means a coming of a dawn, a coming of a new era. Um, and if you want to see any of these videos, you can go to Sacred Earth Solar, Sacred Earth Thought Solar's website, and you can see the video above. And then you can also see videos of um, with my sisters in Sequetmic Territory, the Tiny House Warriors, putting up um, more solar projects um, along the that are blocking the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And um, so you can watch more videos around that. And if you want to learn more about um, any more amazing indigenous communities that there we have 2500 um renewable energy projects across this country that are in in indigenous communities and so we profiled some of these stories on power to the people you can watch power to the people on lumi on aptn i think it's like 49 4.99 a month or something you can stream it um there's 13 episodes and we go from coast to coast to coast profiling amazing community um led initiatives um, with indigenous energy champions within their community building and bringing these projects to life, um, getting off of the, um, you know, getting off of diesel um, and all of the thing, all of the amazing stories that communities are doing across Turtle Island. So to end, you know, what does the future look like? The future looks like self-determination through energy sovereignty, food security, healing the land and healing ourselves, relearning our sacred connection and responsibility to protect mother earth, healing the trauma of white supremacy on all bodies so that we don't perpetuate this trauma onto others. Value, we need to value um, immense, we need to place immense value on the lives of indigenous women um, as this is a worldwide problem, not just an indigenous problem. Self-liberation is also intimately connected and tied to collective liberation. And we need to continue to truth tell and we need to continue to decolonize. So that is the end of my presentation. Hi, hi, thank you so much for listening.